Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. <clears throat> Philippians 3, 8 through 10 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Lord, Heavenly Father, bless. I pray the reading of your word, the preaching to follow. Lord, may my motivation and heart be only to glorify you and lift you up. Would you help me to speak accurately everything that needs to be said from your word? Dear Holy Spirit, would you please take the word and apply it the way you'd have it to go? Lord, magnify yourself in our sight and our hearing this night and for everything you do. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and begin to turn to John chapter 12 as you do. Paul said, I want to know Christ. He was a saved man. So what was he saying? He was saying, I want to know the one who has saved me. I want to be close to him. I want there to be a, a, a relationship that is as close as it can be this side of heaven. The heart cry of every child of God ought to be to know Jesus Christ better every single day of our lives. And if you're going to know him, you have to study his life through his word because though the world says a lot about him, most of what they say bears no resemblance to reality. So we've been studying through his life for more than six years now. The study is called Getting to Know the Real Jesus. We're entering the last day of his life. This is part 135 of our series. This message is called One Final Message. Look at John chapter 12, verse 37 through 50, please. The Bible says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. In the last message, we saw some Greeks coming up to see Jesus. We observed that based on what we read in the audience, he, or in the, in the last message or in the text, he apparently did not grant them the private audience they spoke. Instead, he let them and everyone else know that they were about to see him in a way that no one could ever have imagined seeing him. They were about to see him dying for all the world and drawing all men, including them, to himself. Well, that text ended by saying, these things spake Jesus and then departed and did hide himself from them. As we arrive at our text here in John, we're made privy to the very last public message Jesus ever preached. It happened sometime in the chronological vicinity of those Greeks coming to see him. From this point on, Jesus would speak extensively with his faithful disciples in private. He'd speak privately with Pontius Pilate. He would speak individual phrases from the cross, but this is the last publicly recorded message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've got a couple of preachers in here tonight. Can you imagine what you'd preach if you knew that the message you were about to preach was the last message you were about to preach? I hope there will be no flesh in my message, but I cannot guarantee that. I, I, maybe you are more pious than I am, but if it's the last message, I guarantee you I'm, I'm probably going to have to fight 
keeping the flesh out of it. I'm going to have to fight not, 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 not saying things that my flesh has wanted to say for a very long time. I'm, I'm going I'm to have to fight not, to, not making sure I get the last word on this, that, or the other. That's the way our flesh works. But if I've got any God about me, the last message I preach would ultimately be reflection of the most important things that I could think of to say. That's what any God-called preacher would do, and that's certainly what Jesus, the Son of God, did. So his last message is therefore an incredibly important one for us to study and to consider. So let's dig into this one final message. Notice, first of all, a reassertion of identity. Look at verse 44 and 45. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me for almost all of the 33 plus years of the earthly life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the central controversy surrounding him was that of his identity. And that wasn't just true of his enemies, it was even true of his own family. Uh, Keep a marker there, but go to Luke chapter number two. Let me show you three different passages of scripture pretty quickly where there was controversy about his identity. Luke chapter 2, verse 42 through 50. The Bible says that when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they'd fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing at them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, watch this, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not, did ye not know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. He's 12 years old. He's in the temple. He's been gone for a few days. They've lost track of him. They catch up with him there in the temple. His mother says, son, your father, let's talk about Joseph, your father and I have sought you sorrowing. And he says, why were you seeking me? Didn't you remember that I must be about my father's business? And it says they didn't understand it. How quickly they seem to have forgotten that star. How quickly they seem to have forgotten those shepherds coming to visit. How quickly they seem to have forgotten the angels heralding his birth and telling them what was going to happen. How quickly they seem to have forgotten the wise men and the gifts that they brought. How quickly they seem to have forgotten the vision from heaven that sent them into Egypt to save their lives. How quickly they forgot that they were told point blank that he would be the one who saved his people from their sin and that he would be the son of God the highest. They seem to have forgotten all this in a short 12 years period of time and now they don't even remember his identity. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 and 58. 54 through 58 rather. He, he's now grown up. His public ministry has begun. Mark 13, 54, and when he, was, when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What did they call him? They said, isn't this, isn't this the carpenter's son? Now can you hear the derision in that? Please understand, this was not a lofty title they were giving him. A carpenter in those days was a pretty low profession. They're saying, he's not anybody important. Where did he get all this understanding? He's just, he's just that carpenter's son. But it got even worse as his ministry went on. Look at John chapter 8 verse 44. He's now getting so popular that he's being confronted by the religious elite and he's talking to them about where they're from. And he said in John 8 41, ye, 8, 41, ye do the deeds of your father. 
Here's their response. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Earlier they're, they're saying, Isn't this the carpenter's son? Now they've even lowered that. Now they're saying, Brother Brown, He's not even the carpenter's son. Mary slept with somebody and got pregnant and concocted this story about the virgin birth. He's born of fornication. There's this constant controversy about his identity. Now, it wasn't his fault because he told them over and over and over again what his identity was. Look at John chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Let me show you just one of the many instances in which he told them who he was and notice how they reacted. John five seventeen and 18, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Did he tell them who he was? Did they react well to it? No, they didn't. I could spend the rest of the message giving you example after example of the times when he told them that God the Father was his father and they refused to believe that. The issue of his identity was the main battle of his lifetime and here he was again within hours of his death once again claiming to be the very son of God. Now I want you to get this. He never backtracked from it at all. It caused him trouble time after time after time. His life was in jeopardy over and over again because of it, but for his entire lifetime, he never did back away from the claim that he was the Son of God. Lots of people claim lots of outlandish things. Lots of people claim lots of grandiose things, and then when the heat gets put on them because of that, they backtrack. Jesus never backtracked no matter how high the heat got and here he was again yet at the end of his life openly claiming that if you see him you've seen the father you need to get this Jesus was not just a man there have been lots of men. Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was not just an inspiring religious figure. There have been lots of inspiring religious figures. Jesus was not just an inspiring religious figure. Jesus was not just a prophet. There have been lots of prophets. Jesus wasn't just a prophet. If you view him as merely any of those things or even a combination of all of those things, then you do not truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ until you regard him as the act literal son of God you cannot legitimately claim to believe in him if you regard him any other way you may as well claim to believe in George Washington while not believing that he was the first president of the United States if you regard him any other way you may as well claim to believe in water while not believing there's such a thing as wet if you regard him any other way you may as well claim to believe that the sun is not hot and you could take a walk across it in your bare feet you either believe in Jesus Christ as the son of the living God or you do not believe in him at all so we see reassertion of identity. Notice number two, a restatement of purpose. Look at verses 46 and 47. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, just as he spoke often throughout his life and ministry of his identity, he also spoke often through his life and ministry of his purpose. And in the same two terms that he did right here in this last passage. In the first phrase, verse 46, we find him claiming to be the light. Now, he's done that before. John eight twelve. then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In the second phrase, in verse 47, he referenced the fact that he had come to save the world, not to condemn it. He's done that before. John three seventeen. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John ten ten. The thief cometh not before to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. The Father had every right to send his Son down to this world as a destroyer, yet he didn't do so. The son had every right to come to this world as a destroyer, yet he did not do so. As Jesus said these words, he made a very interesting statement. He said, and if any man hear my words and believe not, 
I judge him not. Stop there. When he says, I judge him not, is there anything you remember that he said early in his ministry that makes you scratch your head just a little bit? In case you don't remember, let me give it to you. John 5, 22, he said, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. But here he says, I judge him not. So how do we reconcile the fact that Jesus in our text said that he did not judge, and yet in John 5, 22, he said that all judgment had been committed to him? And how do we reconcile the fact that Jesus in our text said he did not judge, and yet at the end of Matthew chapter 7, we find him as the one who says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. We'll get the answer to that question, the reconciliation of those two things in the next verse and in the next point. But for now, just please understand that Christ really wanted to drive home the point that his purpose in coming was not to send people to hell, but to keep them from going there. If you go to hell, it's not his fault, it's your fault. If you go to hell, it's not because he didn't want you, it's because you didn't want him. So we see a reassertion of identity, a restatement of purpose. Notice number three, a revelation of judgment. Look at verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, there were probably people standing there at that moment, uh, people who were scratching their heads over the words of Christ in verse 47 because they remember the words that he spoke earlier in John 5, 22. But if they were scratching their heads, and if you've been scratching your head, verse 48 should have, would have, and ought to bring all of that head scratching to a halt. This verse is the reconciliation of those two truths. When you boil it all down to its most basic sense, there are two bases on which you can be judged, personality or principle. In other words, someone can judge you based on whether, for whatever reason, they like you or don't like you, or they can judge you on pre-established principles and whether or not you have abided by them. It has been funny as my children have grown up. We would meet somebody new, and especially when they were very little, we would, we would leave their presence, and sometimes one of the kids would go, I don't like them. And we go, why? I don't know, just don't like them. It was very rare. They usually liked a little bit of everybody, but there was just this thing. For whatever reason, sometimes they just ran into somebody that just, just didn't click with them. You know? Now, if you get to where you're like 60 and 70, 80 and still doing that, you probably got a problem. But, but, but you, can, you can judge people based on whether or not you just automatically like them or don't like them, personality, or or you can judge them on something more solid, which is principle. You can judge them by pre-established principles and whether or not they have abided by them. Is Christ going to judge the world? Yes. But is it going to be some arbitrary, vague, I just don't like you kind of thing? Is that that what it's going to be? Absolutely not. People will be judged by the words Christ spoke and whether or not they received them. If people reject Christ, they'll be judged on the fact that they had his words to go by and they rejected those words and pushed him away. This is the most just and equitable thing in the entire universe. Personality will have nothing to do with it. Looks will have nothing to do with it. Wealth will have nothing to do with it. Accomplishment will have nothing to do with it. Ancestry will will have nothing to do with it. He's given us his words in his word. He's given us enough to go on to know that he told the truth when he claimed to be the son of God. If we find ourselves condemned before him, it will be on the basis of the open words of scripture and the fact that we have rejected those words and therefore rejected them and that led him to him. We see a reassertion of identity, a restatement of purpose, a revelation of judgment. Notice in number four, a reaffirmation of authority. Look at verses 49 and 50. He said, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, he'd just gotten done telling people on what basis he would judge them, and that in reality it would be his words that he'd spoken that would do the judging. As he gets into verse 49, he gives us the why of that by by beginning with a little three-letter word for he said for i've not spoken of myself but the father which sent me he gave me a commandment what i should say and what i should speak 
Now, at this point, we need to identify and define a tiny little two-letter word that makes a world of difference in this passage. That's the word of. Jesus said, I've not spoken of myself. When we see that phrase, it's another one that has the potential to make us scratch our heads unless we understand exactly what that word of means. It does not mean about, as in, I've not spoken about myself. Did Jesus speak about himself? All the time, pretty much every time he spoke, he spoke about himself. The word of does not mean about. If I, if I use the phrase, I am of Shelby, what does it mean? I'm from Shelby. I originate from Shelby. That's exactly what this word means when it is used that way. When Jesus said, I've not spoken of myself, he was using that word of as a word of source, just like we would use the word from. He was saying, I've not made up any of the things I've said among you. All of my words are sourced from the Father. All of the words I've spoken, I've spoken because he commanded me to speak them. That's why it will be the words that Christ spoke that judge us as we saw in verse 48. This was Jesus one more time reaffirming his authority by openly claiming that he was speaking the words of God the Father as he spoke. If you reject the words of Christ, you've rejected the words of God the Father. If you reject Christ, you've rejected God the Father. They are one, they are inseparable, and everything that Christ ever spoke came directly from God the Father. Now he was openly stating this, and he'd reiterated as he spoke the last words of his last public message. Look at verse 50. He said, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now slow down with me just for a few minutes. As Jesus drew this message to a close, he closed it on the most profound of notes. In verse 49, he said that everything he spoke came from the Father. But in verse 50, he said, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore... Even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, do you understand what he was driving at in those words? If I could be so bold as to paraphrase what he said. He basically said, the Father told me what to speak. But I didn't speak those words just because he told me to speak them. I spoke them because it is clear that in those words is life everlasting. That's why I continually speak them and spoke them. Very often... People will take sides and repeat talking points for their side, not even caring that those talking points are disingenuous at best or outright lies at worst. You do realize you get a lot of that in politics. You realize you get a lot of that in the media. People just sort of repeat their side. They repeat the lines from their side. A lot of times they don't even believe what they're saying. They have an agenda that they're driving at. But when Christ spoke the words of God the Father, he didn't merely speak them because of his relation to God the Father. He spoke them because he knew that in those words was everlasting life for me and you. Jesus was about to die. He loved us. He was gonna, never going to speak anything that would be harmful to us. He was giving his life for us. He would only ever and always speak those things which were beneficial to us. And every word of God was beneficial to us because eternal life is found in those words. It was his last message. Just think about that. If his last message showed his priorities, if his priorities had been staying alive or even having his best life now, he would have preached absolutely anything but this. But one more time, he openly preached that he was the son of God and by so doing, in our vernacular, he drove the final nail in his coffin and he knew it. Do not ever forget that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Do not ever forget that he's the only way of salvation. It was literally the last thing he ever preached to us. Not the Sermon on the Mount, not the Lord's Prayer, not the Golden Rule. The last thing he ever preached was that he's the son of God and the only way way of salvation. It was his last message. Let's all stand heads, but eyes are closed. Mustang makes her way up, but the ship makes his way up. He is the Son of God. 
and the only way of salvation. You can't go by your works. You can't go by Buddha. You can't go by Muhammad. You can't go by Confucius. You can't go by Mary or the Pope. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're here tonight and you've received Christ as your Savior, congratulations. You're joint heirs of Christ and a brother and sister in Christ. But if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've been trying to keep the law to go to heaven, you're lost. If you've been trying to be good to go to heaven, you're lost. If you've been trying to make sure that your positive deeds outweigh your negative deeds, you're lost. Salvation only comes by placing your faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing who he was and what he did on Calvary and that he rose from the dead. If you don't know him, tonight would be a great day to come to know him.